welcome back. We are going to be taking a look at round five, which took place Saturday night, 6 p.m. for the U.S. Senior Invitational Online. We got the cookie monster, Eric Cook, with black in this game. And you heard me right, and you didn't miss it. Round four will not be a video, sadly, because... As I'm pulling into Eric's driveway about 11 a.m., round time starts at 12. I've got plenty of time to get him back to the house. No rush, you know. Car is entering in to his driveway. I got the, the two front tires on pavement in the driveway, and then all of a sudden, I get broadsided. I'll tell you, it's not a good way to start the day. And I did have kind of a, a Superman moment to where time kind of slowed down and I see glass shards from my passenger window just kind of fly and land all around. It's kind of neat from that perspective, but uh, kind of a day ruiner. So I gave the TDs a call. Well, I gave John Haskell a call. You know, he's main man in Florida. And let him know, as he's one of the TDs for the event, that we're definitely not making it for round four for obvious reasons. So thankfully I was able to uh, not get hurt, you know, <laughs> that's kind of important to mention. And uh, we were able to get Eric back for round five. So let's focus on the positive now. So round four, it's behind us. We get a forfeit loss, even though to me, I felt like with an hour notice, pairings definitely could have been redone. Zero point by, so the other player would have been able to play. But Eric gets a forfeit win in round one, and he gives a forfeit win in round four. So I personally apologize for not doing anything wrong and getting broadsided. Yeah, It's one of the fastest turnarounds I've ever seen with an insurance company. They're already cutting a check for the vehicle, and it's only been three days. So without further ado, the positive. Here... This, this is fine art, folks, because I'm happy to report that my, my preparation assisting Eric, like in the previous two games, was spot on. And I, I got something that is way, way off the beaten path. And this is going to be one of those things that showcases what I do in my chessable text. Um... I have authored a number of different opening texts, and typically I get off the beaten path and recommend things that you don't often see, but I check it pretty thoroughly with the engine, and I like creative chess. And, you know, Eric, he's great. He likes creative chess too, and we have ourselves an English player. And regardless of what move order he uses, he typically is going to get the same position. And you got to be careful with this move order, knight of three, c5, because if you're not a Sicilian player and they hit you with e4, well, welcome to Sicilian. Thankfully, Eric is, so he didn't have any problem with his transposition. c4, well, we're gonna get our standard English, and what I mean by standard is white is going through the motions here, and with the knight on f3, that's what I consider to be the standard position. Now, if I come back and I change this move order up, and let's say black is a little bit inflexible here, at this point, white has a number of different structures he can choose from. This being the Botvinnik structure, this being what I consider the Fisher structure, because of that famous candidates game between Petrosian and Fisher. And then the classical structure. And you normally see in the classical structure, this I'll just kind of emphasize it, A3, B4 is the plan. And it's a very straightforward plan for white. So coming back to our main game, after D6, white plays A3 which is exemplifying the, this plan that he plans to play b4. And I do not feel that this is the, the most accurate move order because of what we had prepared. There's many different ways to play for black, 
And, you know. Yeah, you know me, uh, I coach a lot of students, and I typically give them some pretty nasty opening prep. And we're going to start off with this move, queen d7. And you go, you're blocking in your bishop. I, I, I don't get it. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, if you look up a game between Nakamura and Carlsen in the English, you will find this queen d7 idea, and the boss himself used it with black. The game ended up being a draw, but it, it had a lasting impression on me, and when I see a key game and a new idea, I get excited, and I want to test it out. And what's significant about this move, white is going to go for his normal plan, but black can go b6, bishop b7, and we're counteracting this bishop so that b5 is never a problem. The knight can move, the bishop's covered, we don't have a rook issue. We are getting ready to meet b4 by this diamond structure and c5 being the focal point. And we got another little trick that we'll see. Well, white goes rook b1, and now here's the idea. We're going to go completely counterintuitive, and this is straight Carlsen here, just like the Nakamura Carlsen game. Bishop takes c3, and you go, but that's the good bishop. Stay with me, because either way, white captures, you're going to get an interesting game. In the main game, white decided to capture b takes c3, and we continue with b6. And white's going through the motions here. I do like the, the testing move h4, but say it just castles. The main idea we have is actually to castle queenside, and we have such a flexible pawn structure we can work with here. You can attack in the center or go after the white king directly. And this is not so much of an English position anymore as a dynamic and interesting game where you can go after him and attack. And that's not something English players typically want to see. So I think this is a line that you should keep your eye on because it's definitely going to end up in one of my future books. So, you know, little, little teaser taste for the Florida Chess Association page on theory. So coming back here, bishop b7, h4. And of course... All I, I showed Eric was queen d7, take on c3, and castle queenside. And before the game, Eric's like, well, that's different. That looks fun. I'm going to do it. He loves dynamic chess, and I love working with players who love dynamic chess. And this is where our stylistic differences will show. See, me, I see h4 and go, h5 could be an issue in some variations, so personally, I would play h6. And my idea is if h5 is ever played, well, g5 just gives me space. And if something like bishop f4 is played, well, I can go e5, knight c to e7, because I don't want to worry about queen d2. This knight's holding it down. And I have the flexibility to start pressing over here, and we're having a good time. Now... Eric being the battler that he is, he's like, all right, <laughs> prove it. Hit me. He just goes queenside. And in the main game, e4 was played. And I, I thought objectively, if it's going to be allowed, white should go for this h5 line. And in which case, knight f6 has to be played. And notice the difference between h6 and knight f6. We had much more flexibility with h6. But bishop h3, we have to do something about that. And you gotta find some accurate moves here, but we get this dynamic and interesting position, which is right up Eric style. And I, I feel that white is definitely worse here. <laughs> I mean, your king's wide open. Our king's relatively safe. For a price of a pawn, come on now. You got your play. So castle queenside, e4 by white. And here, f5 would, would probably be a bit, bit more dynamic. You, you constantly need to be watching out for this idea. So, f5, I like. And we get this type of game where knight g5 really can't be justified if castles e5. And Eric has a really easy position. But with e5, we, we start to get into... Black gets on his back foot after e5, and this is one of the few times in the game 
White has a little bit of counterplay, but still not really worse. Bishop g5, giving a tickle to the rook on d8. No, no, no. Going to f8, supporting the f pawn. Now h5, and keep in mind, we got to be really careful because he could take. We have to take back with the f pawn because we don't want to hang the rook, and then bishop h3 is going to skewer the queen and king. So, if you like to pause the video, you see the threat now. The difference in strength in players is how they problem solve. Identifying the problem is the first step. I've given you the problem. This is where you pause the video and figure out what is the best way to deal with this threat of takes and bishop h3 with the skewer. Okay, if you're not a pause person, we're moving right ahead, giving you the opportunity to pause again now. All right, continuing. King b8 just completely gets away from this bishop h3 idea where we can move. Simple, effective, flexible, and covers the a7 pawn just a little bit more to boot, making the king a bit safer. Excellent move by Eric and first choice by the engine. Knight h4, f6. Now... The coiled spring. The king side hadn't moved. Now we're going to gradually push those pieces right out. Bishop e3. And I love this move. Queen g7. Don't have a bishop? No problems. We can fee and code the lady. Lady's fine on g7, holding all the key squares. Again, coiled spring. We're waiting to get some space over here. So in the event, in the main game, queen e2 happened, but in the event of castle king side, we have knight h6, and this is a cool idea, covering f5. So on queen c1, we have g5, and this knight doesn't really have a good place to go. So that's, that's a neat idea, and if queen e2, which happened in the main game, we get the ball rolling on the attack with f5. And after queen d2, um, I like Eric's move because it continues pressure where it matters with queen f7. But uh, I really, really like the engine's move. Knight a5. With the idea that I want to capture here, making that c pawn fall. So it forces this capture. We get rid of a strong bishop. And we still have a big attack with f4. And, I mean, great things are happening in the position. Queen f7 keeps the tension nicely. After f4... Knight f6, and this is Eric's type of game. This is where he really shines, where you have mass complications and many different variations here, and it's about to get fun. His opponent decides to clip, and that just can't be recommended. This rook is now in the game and interested in the action. So white elected the castle king side here. Now let's get nasty. Queen h7, saying, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at where your king's at, sir. Rook BE1, knight h5, adding more pressure to these pawns, causing some defense, queen f2. And this, this is where it's just black is fully in the driver's seat. White has made a ball on the king side of pieces just for defense. Time for the breakthrough. F takes e4 was what was played in the game, and it is good enough. But there is an absolutely beautiful move here in g5. And things can fall apart quite quickly. Say, for instance, knight takes f5 is met by knight takes f4, where if you just grab the knight, you end up in this type of mate situation. So things are falling apart here. There's not much that white can do. And that move at g5 is just, ah, it's beautiful. F takes E4 was played in the game. And Eric begins to rip open this position here. Bishop takes G6 with the in-between move. It's okay. We just sidestep. Still have all the pressure. Attacking the bishop on E3. Lining up with the king with the X-ray. So after bishop takes F4, clip. And... Not really anywhere to go for white here. G takes f4, and we've got multiple moves that we can play. But after queen f6, Eric's opponent had enough. 
and resigned. So hopefully you enjoyed Game 5 from the Senior Championship. We'll be finishing up the series with Game 6 in the next video.